troubled times. That's what we find ourselves in when dealing with um, the coronavirus and the effects that it's having on our lives right now. And when it comes to troubled times, though, especially the, the time we find ourselves in now, uh, the trouble is sort of being experienced in a lot of different ways. Um, one way we're experiencing trouble is major inconvenience. You go to the store and the things that you want to purchase aren't available. Uh, you go to uh, the pharmacist and you got to wait in line. Uh, you have to um, uh, watch out how close you are to people. And um, you stand in line at co- to get into Costco and all of a sudden you realize you're, you're real close to people. And then now you're listening for who's coughing and who's sneezing. And, and uh, there's some anxiety. So that's another way people are experiencing trouble right now is they're uh, feeling a sense of anxiety and worry. Uh, Some of us, because our jobs have been stopped, are wondering where the next paycheck is going to come from, and are we going to be able to make the mortgage payment? And there's a real concern about the economy and the effect it's going to have on our uh, city and on our region and on our country. And and so there's trouble. And and so the question is, what, what do we do with that? And the Bible asks an interesting question about trouble that I want us to approach Uh, from 2 Corinthians chapter 12 this morning. And this is the question I want us to answer, uh, at least from the Bible. And it may be uh, a question you don't want to ask, but it's a question I think the Bible answers for us nonetheless. And here's, here's the question. What is gained in troubled times? What is gained uh, in troubled times? Because the apostle Paul in this passage is talking about some trouble that he was dealing with. And he explains to us the gain he got from it. And what we want to do is be able to look at trouble from a biblical perspective and say, what am I to gain from this? What should come out of this? Uh, should it end? Uh, should, should it come to an end like we all hope it does in a, in a matter of, of months? Uh, what is the gain that I should hope to get from it? And I think the Bible really gives us a good idea on what to, to do to, to, to appreciate the gain that we ought to get. Uh, from trouble. So let's start. We've got three ideas here. And the first thing is this. What is gained in troubled times? And the first thing is this. There is actually no gain in pride of place. There is no gain in an elevated, affirmed, esteemed, and exalted position. That's not where gain is found. Gain is found isn't, isn't found in being exalted. Gain is actually found in trouble. So what is gained in troubled times? The first thing we learned is there's no gain in pride of place or being exalted. You might think about it this way. It's kind of a silly illustration, but uh, if you want to learn how to fix cars, what good would it be for you if your car never broke down? Now, for most of us, uh, we would prefer that our car never break down. But for a person who wants to learn how to fix a car, every now and then the car needs to be broken down so that they know how to fix it. There's no gain to only having cars that are working well for somebody who wants to become a better mechanic. They need broken cars in order to become a better mechanic. And this is the thing we discover about our spiritual life, is most of us want everything to go perfectly our whole life, and we realize over time that there's gain in things getting messed up because that's where we learn how to address those things. And what the Apostle Paul says is, When things are going the way they ought to go, not only is there a risk of missing out on the gain of growth from trouble, there's also a risk of pride. So look what happens. It's a really interesting story. Look what happens in uh, verse 1 of chapter 12. Paul says, I must go on boasting, but there's nothing to be gained by it. So he says right away, there's no gain in having things that have put you in an exalted and higher position. There's no gain in being exalted and having everything go the way you want them. He says there's nothing to be gained by it. What was going on in the church of Corinth is they were looking down on Paul because they didn't feel like Paul was giving them enough miracles. Uh, his show wasn't fancy enough when he came. He, he was kind of lowbrow. He didn't use any big fancy theological words. He didn't do enough miracles from their perspective. He didn't attract big enough crowds. All he yammered on over and over again was the cross of Christ saves sinners. And it was a nonstop uh, explanation of the gospel, and they were tired of it. They wanted the show. They wanted the miracles and demons being cast out and, and people being healed and visions and revelations. And Paul wasn't giving them that. He was just giving them the gospel. But he was coming to them and saying, well, if I wanted to boast about visions, I've got some visions I can boast about. And he says this in verse 2 of Second Corinthians 12. 
I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Now, he's talking in the third person, and that was very typical of speakers during that time, especially when they were talking about something that might seem uh, to benefit their reputation. He's talking in the third person. It's sort of a way of humbly addressing an experience he had. But Paul's talking about himself. He's saying, I was caught up to the third heaven. Later on, we, he makes it quite clear that that is paradise. It's the place of God. Paul was caught up to heaven, and he saw the things of heaven and the things of God before his death. So he's saying to the Corinthian believers, you want to talk about visions? You want to talk about exalted visions and amazing, miraculous things happening? I've been caught up to heaven, and I've seen things in heaven. Look at what he says in verse 3. I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether he was in the body or not, I don't know, he says. He heard things he cannot uh, tell. He heard things that could not be uttered. So he heard and saw things in heaven that couldn't be said. He saw things that were so amazing they couldn't be uttered. He could be meaning two different things here or two things at the same time. Number one, he may have seen things and God told him, don't tell anybody about this. That wouldn't be the only place in the Bible where that occurs. In the book of Revelation, the apostle John heard the thunder of God and it spoke some words and he was getting ready to write down what the thunder had spoken and the angel said to him, no, don't write that part down. And so we know this has happened before or will happen later and this is something that wouldn't be too unusual. Paul went up to heaven, saw things and God said, don't tell anybody what you saw. The other side of this, which was likely also true, he saw things that he had no way of describing. Uh, think of it this way. Maybe you know somebody who is blind. In particular, maybe you know somebody who has been blind since birth. How would you describe the color blue to someone who has been blind since birth? There would be no reference point. There would be no way to describe for something be this to them because they have no reference point for what blue would look like. And this is what Paul is encountering. He's in heaven how could he possibly describe the eternal things of God to people like us who have never seen anything that's eternal? And so Paul is saying, you want to talk about visions? You want to talk about things that people can brag about? Listen, I've been to heaven and back, and I've seen things people can't talk about. Now, that's a pretty big thing to brag about, and we know that. Nowadays, it seems like every other day, somebody's going to heaven, and of course, they're writing a book about it. And I think it's interesting that Paul, when he goes to heaven, one of the few places in the Bible where we have someone recorded going to heaven, God makes it quite clear, keep your trap shut. And nowadays, it seems like everybody who ends up in heaven somehow has a book to write. And Paul is saying, I don't have anything to brag about. And why would Paul not brag about the fact that he went to heaven? Because of this, verse 1, there is nothing to be gained by it. Paul is saying, if the goal is to be self-assured, if the goal is to seem noteworthy, if the goal is to have the right credentials, if the goal is to impress people, if the goal is to make sure everybody thinks he's a spiritual giant, then he should tell his story about going to heaven. However, if the goal is knowing Christ, there's nothing to be gained by it. There's nothing to be gained by pride of place. There's nothing to be gained by being exalted. Trouble yields gain. Exalted position doesn't yield gain. So if the goal is to be noteworthy and exalted, in fact, the one thing we would want to avoid is trouble at all costs. We can think of Job's friends in the book of Job. When Job went through all of his troubles, they accused him of not being very close to God. And that's exactly what's happening in the city of Corinth. Because Paul is going through troubles, and because he's not sharing these exalted visions, their argument is, he must, be not, he must not be that close to God, he's going through difficulty. Their view is, the spiritual person should avoid trouble, whereas the unspiritual person is always going to find themselves in trouble. Paul's incredible experience, though, he says, is not a gain. In fact, his incredible experience was intended to be personal, between him and God alone, and it wasn't intended to be useful for ministry. In fact, he describes his, his vision of heaven as a burden. He had a burden because he had a temptation to use his exalted vision to boast 
about his exalted position in heaven uh, because he had got to go there. So now this thing that most people would think is a, is a benefit, is an asset to their spirituality, Paul is actually describing as a burden. Look at verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 12. Though if I should wish to boast, I wouldn't be a fool, for I'd be speaking the truth. So what he's saying is, if I wanted to boast about my vision, I could because it would be true. But I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears in me. Paul felt there was more benefit to the gospel being presented in a lowly person than in an exalted person. What he says is, we want to escape trouble because we think that's where lowliness is. And his argument is going to be, lowliness is actually where connection with God is found most profoundly. Look at verse 5, and Pat read it. We're going to read it again. On behalf of this man, that is himself in heaven, on his, not on my own behalf, but I will not boast except of my weaknesses. One, 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 uh, one more time, so uh, I can actually read it properly. But on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. His weakness is where he wanted to boast because that is where he would find closeness with God and the ability to communicate the gospel most effectively. And what he is saying is the elevated position of being the exalted one who's been to heaven removes his opportunity to boast in the gospel. His power is found in weakness. His power is found in trouble, not when everything's going well. There is no gain in pride of place, Paul would say. Now, this goes against everything we've ever been told. We've been told we're supposed to cover our bases. We're supposed to make sure everything's handled. We're supposed to uh, be good, upstanding uh, citizens and and keep our nose clean. And uh, it goes against everything we've ever been told to be willing to present ourselves as weak and frail. It goes again, we're supposed to be competent and strong and confident and self-assured and have everything handled. And that's what everything is supposed to be like. And Paul is saying here, there's no gain in pride of place. How is the gospel going to take root in somebody who has no need? What is gained in troubled times, the first thing we have to pay attention to, there is no gain in pride of place. Why would we boast in our weaknesses? Let's look at verse 7. And this is where we're going with this. Uh, To be like Jesus... The part of me that is not like Jesus needs to die. And trouble can do that. But it's hard. And one more time, in case you weren't paying attention, or you're up at the fridge getting a snack. To be like Jesus, the parts of me that are not like Jesus, those parts need to die. And trouble can do that, even though it is terribly hard. So the second thing, verse 7, what is gained in troubled times we gain holiness in hardship. We gain holiness in hardship. Here's a question that I'm going to ask, and this is going to seem like a strange question, but think of it nonetheless. What if you had a sin that you just can't shake? What if you had some kind of sin in your life? I don't know what it is that you just can't seem to shake. You just can't seem to get rid of it. Now, I know none of you have that problem at all, but let's just pretend for the sake of argument, you had a sin uh, you can't get rid of. You, can't, you just can't seem to shake it. But what if God made a way that you would never succumb to that sin again? You have a sin you can't shake. What if God were to make a way so that you were to never fall to that sin again? Would you take God up on that offer? Let's read verse 7. Before you answer yes, let's read verse 7. So Paul says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. So Paul had these exalted visions. He had been to heaven and back. He had seen things that were so amazing. He was told not to tell anybody about them. And because these visions were so exalted that it could very easily build up in him pride and arrogance and conceitedness, God decided to provide for Paul the means for him to avoid pride. And that means is very strange. 
a thorn in his flesh, but more specifically, a messenger or an angel of Satan was sent to harass Paul to make sure and ensure that he wasn't going to become conceited in these exalted visions uh, that he had had. So here's the point we're going for, and we'll try to describe this in a little more detail, but here it is. Some of our holiness is only developed because God brings difficulty in our, into our lives that will yield Christ-likeness in our lives. We gain holiness in hardship. Some of our holiness in our life is only possible because God brings hardship into our lives. And the hardship that Paul was given to help him avoid arrogance because of his exalted visions was an angel of the devil who brought a thorn in the flesh, some sort of physical ailment. We don't know exactly what that physical ailment is. It really doesn't even matter. The way Paul described this physical ailment was a thorn in the flesh. There's nothing pleasant about that. There's no way to, whatever the ailment was, it was such that it brought pain and discomfort uh, to his life. And it may seem strange that God would help Paul avoid pride by giving him significant pain. If you and I were to argue with God about this, we might go to God and say, listen, I've got an idea, God. Why don't you just fix the pride problem in Paul's life? Why don't you just fill him with your spirit, give him a good Bible study, give him a good accountability group, somebody to kind of speak into his life, and we can take care of the pride that way, and there's no need for all this hardship and pain. And God's response is, it brings him the most glory to deal with Paul's arrogance in this particular way. That Paul is now able to avoid pride, not because he's a good Christian, not because he's a good theologian, not because he has good friends around him, but because God has seen fit to give him a thorn in his side. So what is gained in troubled times? We gain holiness in hardship. There are certain kinds of things that occur in our heart during difficulty that cannot occur when we're not in troubled times. Paul had had this incredible personal experience that would, by its very nature, produce pride and arrogance, especially as an apostle and an evangelist. And this pain was added to his life. And the apostle Paul is saying this pain and trouble for him was, in fact, a blessing. And the reason it's a blessing is because it's working out in him something that cannot be worked out in any other way. Christ-like humility in the Apostle Paul was the result of the trouble uh, he was facing. So God had sent uh, the devil, uh, an, an angel of the devil, to bring a thorn in the flesh to Paul's life. And of course, we referred to Job earlier and his friends. This isn't the first time something like this has happened. Uh, The devil was in heaven talking to God, and God said, what are you up to? And the devil said, well, I've been walking around. And God said, well, look at Job. He's a pretty good guy. And and the devil challenged God and said, what would happen if I took away his kids? What would happen if I took away his money? What would happen if I took away his health? And God said, go ahead, go do that. And what happened was something occurred in Job's life, a journey of pain that led him to a relationship with God He never could have had if it hadn't been for that trouble. And Paul is seeing himself in the same place. He is in trouble. He is having a thorn in his flesh. It is working out Christ's likeness in his heart that cannot be worked out any other way. To be like Jesus in righteousness is the greatest gift that God can give us. Now, think about that for a minute. Uh, You pray for a lot of things. I pray for a lot of things. And and the list goes on and on, things we might be praying for. But we need to understand the reality is this. To be like Jesus in righteousness is the greatest gift that God gives us. If you're unsure of that, read Ephesians chapter 1. The greatest gift that we can receive from God is righteousness to be like Jesus. And what trouble does is it puts our heart in the perfect position to look at our heart and say, wow, I got a bunch of places where I'm not like Jesus. I need to say no to that and yes to God's ways. Trouble gives us the opportunity to repent in ways that blessing and everything going the way they ought to go never does. Trouble brings us to that place where we can say, God, what am I thinking? 
how did I let this grow in my life? How did I let this reality, this pride, this arrogance, this anger, this uh, anxiety, this uh, idolatry and lust, how did I let this get out of control? And you say, well, how do I know if those things are happening? Because you're facing trouble uh, in this current situation we find ourselves in. And like many of us, you might find yourself praying more than you normally do. So you're sitting down at the table and you're going to pray that you don't lose your job. And you're going to pray that you're able to, to, to get the supplies you need at the store. And the pharmacy isn't going to run out of what you need. And you sit down to pray. And all of a sudden, in the back of your mind, there's a whole list of things that you say in your mind. Well, I don't know if God's going to listen to me because i got all these things going on. Now, the good news is God does hear you as a Christian because Christ died on the cross for you. So you don't have to worry about that. However, the prompting of the Spirit to bring those things to mind is the exact opportunity trouble is intended to bring, is to bring those to the forefront and say, God, I know you hear me because Jesus died for me. But you've brought these things to mind, God. What is going on in my, in this, in, what is going on in my life? Why have I allowed this in my life? And trouble brings us to that place of repentance that oftentimes doesn't happen any other way. Now, I need to address an issue because some of you are like me. And you say, so are you saying that God caused a global pandemic so that I might confess of my desire to be rich and greedy? No, that's not what I'm saying. What's the reason for the pandemic? The reason for the pandemic is we live in a fallen world. And if we really want to get to the root of why do we live in a broken world that has disease and death and fear, it's because we abandon God's and God and, and His ways and we've sinned against Him. So what God does is take the realities of our broken world, in this case a pandemic, and He takes and uses the brokenness of this world and pushes us into the trouble of it so that we have the opportunity in the difficulty to repent and, and say, okay, God, you're right. There are parts of my life that aren't like Jesus, and I want to give those to you. God uses the brokenness of our world to his ends to bring out Christ's likeness in us. What is gained in troubled times if we're willing in humility and grace by God's power to repent and say, God, I see what's going on here. I see what's going on in my heart. I need your grace in my heart, and I don't know why I've been holding on to these things. God, help me to say no to those things and yes to Christ. Help me to repent and see my heart cleansed before you. Then we have gained something in trouble that trouble is designed to gain. Verse 7 again, to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in, in the flesh. So right now we get a thorn in our flesh of all the difficulty this situation is causing us. And the question is, are we going to take full advantage of it? Or are we just going to let it slide and just kind of try and make it through? To take full advantage of it, we ought to take stock of our heart and say, God, what do I need to repent of? What has this trouble ginned up in my heart that I need to say, Lord, I don't know why I let that go on. It's time to say no to that. Here's a question you might ask yourself. Would you be willing to endure pain if it meant you were free of sin? Think of that pet sin, and again, you don't have it, right? A, a sin you just can't shake. What if God came to you and said, listen, I can fix that, but it's going to mean you're going to be in pain for the rest of your life. Would you say yes? Would you say, okay, God, that's a good deal because now that sin will be behind me. I'm going to have pain going forward, but the sin is behind me. Would you say, yeah, that sounds like a good deal, God. Now, if you're like me and most of us, you would hesitate to take that deal. You say, well, God, is there any other way that I can maybe handle this sin? Uh, maybe there's, maybe I'll get over that sin, God, if you bless me and I make more money. Is there any chance we could go that route? And God comes to us and says, if, if I could get you over that sin, but it's going to be a pain, would you take it? And our hesitancy to take that deal reveals the condition of our heart. We don't think sin is as bad as it really is. What is gained in troubled times? If we're willing to submit to God and his truth as he reveals what's going on in our hearts, we gain holiness in hardship. God takes those parts of us that aren't like Christ. And when we yield to him and say, God, I see it now. I never saw it before, but now that we're in this difficulty, I see it. He can take those parts of our heart and shape them into the image of Christ for his glory and his grace. Hardship, as it turns out, is 
Uh, well, it's hard. I think it's actually in the word. Hardship is, in fact, hard. The question is, how in the world do we get through it? Having a thorn in the flesh sounds terrible. How do we get through it? And the fact is, the Apostle Paul tells us how he gets through it. So let's read it again in verses 8, 9, and 10. How do we get through uh, troubled times? How do we encounter the power of God's grace? Uh, look with me again at verse uh, 8 of Second Corinthians chapter 12. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Again, Paul's talking about the thorn in his flesh. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What is gained in troubled times? We gain grace in weakness. We gain grace in weakness. Now, we don't know if the Olympics are going to happen this summer or not, right? But you remember one of the great Olympians of our time is a guy named Usain Bolt. He's a pretty fast runner. And if you've seen him compete in the 200 Uh, Even when competing against the world's best sprinters, he's running and it seems like everybody else is standing still. That's just how fast Usain Bolt is. It's incredible. Now, what if you were going to race Usain Bolt? What if I said you're going to race Usain Bolt? Uh, How do you think you're going to do? Well, you're going to do lousy. You're not nearly as fast as him and you're not motivated to do the training he does to, to get that fast, nor are you naturally gifted the way he is. None of us are. But what if I told you you can race Usain Bolt in the 200 and you get to ride a motorcycle. Would you take, what do you think of that race? Now the average world-class sprinter is gonna max out somewhere between 20, maybe 22 miles an hour. But most motorcycles, even a little scooter I ride can go faster than 22 miles an hour. So how would you do against Usain Bolt if you were allowed to ride a motorcycle? Well, you'd win every time because a motorcycle goes much faster than Usain Bolt will ever go. And this is exactly what Troubled Times does for us. It finally gets us to give up our own strength and say, I want to ride the motorcycle of the power of God's grace. Another way of thinking about this, the strongest you could ever be is not nearly as strong as Christ in you. The strongest you could ever be as a Christian is not nearly as strong as Christ and his grace being strong in you. And what troubled times does is it gets you to finally Get off of your own power and say, I need Jesus more than ever. And what we discover when we finally will get off of our own legs and get onto the motorcycle of God's grace, we can go faster and stronger than we ever have before. This is what Paul says. Look, verse 8. Three times he prayed with the Lord that his thorn in the flesh would leave him. Now, it doesn't mean he just prayed three times and then and then quit. Well, three times, I guess he's not going to answer. No, it's a figure of speech. He's saying, I prayed over and over and over again pleading with the Lord that he would take this this thorn in the flesh from me. And it looks like God actually answered him verbally. Wouldn't that be great if you were praying? God actually gave you his answer verbally. He said, here's the answer. Well, it would be great unless you got the answer Paul got in verse 9. God says this, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. So he prays for relief And he trusts that God's answer is the best answer God could ever give. He takes joy in seeking the Lord, and he takes joy even in not getting what he wanted. He didn't get what he wanted. He didn't get relief from the thorn in the flesh. He got something much better. The power of the grace of Christ worked out in him. Look what it says in verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you. Now, we, we all know this verse. This is a, a very familiar verse. And most often we use this verse and quote it when we've done a really terrible, terrible sin. And we'll say, you know, I've done this terrible thing, and God's grace, though, is sufficient for me. And you know what? That is true, and we should continue to rely on God's grace uh, in that way. But this is actually even speaking uh, much broadly, much more broadly than just about sin. He is saying, Paul, in your weakness, in your insufficiency, in your brokenness, In everything you lack, in power, ability, confidence, competence, my grace is sufficient for you. Another way of saying this, all you will ever need, Paul, is my grace. All you will ever need for the rest of your life 
is my grace. My power, God says, is made perfect. It comes to its completion in your weakness. So I could ask this question this way. Would you like as much of God's power as you could possibly have in your life? And the answer to that is, of course, I want as much of God's power in my life as I could possibly have. The way that occurs is in your weakness, not in your strength, not in your competence, not in your abilities, not in your smarts, not in your good behavior. It's made full, it's made complete in your weakness. The more we get to the place where we realize all we need is God's grace, the more we realize how weak we are, the more we experience God's power in our life. And Paul is saying, why would I share this, this unbelievable vision of heaven, which would lead to me standing on my own strength and my own power, when in humiliation and brokenness, I can experience the power of God? Another way of saying this, why would I run the race on my own two feet when I can ride on the motorcycle? When I can go fast and free on God's power, why would I work so hard in my own power? So he says this, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest in me. He says, I will boast in Jesus because he makes the weakest of us strong. His power is strong. Paul rests and is content and is satisfied in the strength of Christ alone. He boasts in his weakness. He boasts in how he doesn't measure up. Paul would be one of those people that would be awkward to be around because he would be honest with you with his sin. He would say, here's where I struggle with sin. And he would be boasting in that because he knows the grace of Christ covers that sin. To boast in the grace of Christ is not the same thing as being okay with sin. He's saying, I am a broken man and I need God's grace again today. Most of us, when we boast about sin, we like to boast after we fixed it. We like to make sure all our, de- all our problems are handled, and then we want to give a, a, a fancy testimony about how, we've nev- how we broke, got over all this sin. Paul's testimonies were different. Here's basically his testimony in this passage. I'm an arrogant son of a gun, and the only way I can get over it is for God to give me a pain in my side, a thorn in my flesh. That's my story. If God were to take this thorn in the flesh in the way, away, pretty good chance I'd be an arrogant son of a gun again. And most of us, if we heard that kind of a testimony, we'd say, boy, this guy is not a very good Christian. What do you think Paul would say to that? You're right. Jesus is sufficient for me. He's going to ride that grace motorcycle fast and hard because Jesus powerful in him is better than him being powerful. God working his holiness out in Paul's life through trouble and through difficulty is better than Paul working out his own Christian life. So what is gained in troubled times? We gain grace in weakness. When we go through in things like we're going through now, when we all of a sudden realize we have very little control over our day-to-day lives, in a matter of a week's time, everything you and I thought we had control over got taken away. All of a sudden, we realize we have no control over anything. We thought we did. And now we realize we don't. And in that weakness, we can gain the grace of Christ because it brings us to that place where we can finally say, God, I need you and your grace to be sufficient for me, not myself, not my own ability to provide, not my own ability to have things handled, not my own ability to keep things together. God, your grace is sufficient for me. Your power is made perfect in weakness. You can think of the power in your life, and you can think of it like we talked about, a runner and a motorcyclist. And the question is, on that 100-meter dash or that 200-meter dash, How much of that race do you want to run, and how much of that race do you want to ride on the motorcycle? And the fact is, the more we're willing to acknowledge our weakness and ride the motorcycle, the faster we're going to go. And one of the gifts of troubled times is a recognition of our weakness. That's not a bad thing. It's a great gain. If in humility we're willing to acknowledge our weakness and come to God and learn uh, the grace, the power of his grace. Look how he ends this in verse 10. For the sake of Christ then, whose whose glory and whose power is he concerned about? The glory of Christ. He says this, for the sake of Christ then, I am content. I'm okay. I'm satisfied. I'm, I'm squared away. I'm good is another way we might say that. 
I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Now, the two in there that might apply to the moment in time we find ourselves today are these two. I am content with hardships. I am content with calamities. Understand what Paul is saying here. He's not saying, I can endure it and get through the hardship and calamity. He is saying, I'm content with it. If this is the new normal for all of time, and it means now on a day in and day out basis, I'm going to have to wake up in the morning and call out for the grace of Christ again today. Paul is saying, what a great gift. What a great gift is the grace of Christ made manifest through hardships and calamities. He has become so content with the power of God's grace in his heart, the grace to forgive sins, the grace to encounter God even in brokenness and weakness, that he says, if hardship and calamity brings more of that, then I am content with that for the sake of Christ. Look at the last sentence of verse 10. This requires faith. For when I am weak, then I am strong. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He is saying, when I recognize who is really God in this relationship, then I am strong because I can put myself under the work of God and humbly submit to what he's doing in my life. If weakness brings me more of Jesus, and if trouble makes me feel weak, then what Paul is saying is, give me more trouble so I can get more of Jesus. If weakness brings more of Jesus, and if trouble makes me understand how weak I am, then Paul is saying, give me more trouble. Now, most of us this last week have not been saying, bring more trouble, God. Most of us, and myself included, have been saying, God, why all this trouble? And that's a fair question. God, what's going on? What should we, we be doing? What's the right way to respond and, and serve and worship in a time uh, with such difficulty? But one of the things we have to be willing to do as believers is look at our own hearts and say, God, am I following you or has my arrogance gotten away? And is this time of weakness and fear and trouble an opportunity for me to turn my eyes back to the one who can give me his power? Can I get to the place by the grace of Christ where I say, I am content with the weakness this trouble has brought? What is gained in troubled times? Three things, and, and we're going to close with this. There is no gain in pride of place. This might be a chance for us to open our eyes and look at our own hearts. When you think about your own story, the story of your life, and you think about the trajectory of your life and how you like to uh, recollect and fondly think of the things of your life, the question becomes this. Is the story of your life a, a story of you being awesome? Is it a story of one win to the next win to the next win? Is it a story of win and when you lose, you just got to figure out how to win again? And what Paul is saying here is there is gain when we experience loss. That in fact, there may be very clearly more to be gained in loss than in win. And what we can say quite clearly from this passage is when we are strong on our own, when we are strong in our own strength, our own competence, our own power, our own stick to our own good behavior, then it is a loss because we don't experience the grace of God when we have to be strong. What is gained in troubled times? There is no gain in pride of place. Secondly, we gain holiness in hardship. Here's a, another question, another way of asking the question I asked earlier. If you never had trouble again for the rest of your life, you never had trouble again, what if God came to you and said, I will make it so that you will never have another problem for the rest of your life. However, you will never be more like Jesus. How you, your current spiritual condition is, is what will be when, when you finish your days. Would you take God up on that offer? If he said, listen, I can make it so you never have trouble again as long as you live, but you will not grow in the grace of Christ at all for the rest of your life. Would you take him up on that offer? Or are we willing to say, God, I would not take anything other than the grace of Christ, even when or especially when it's found in times of trouble? We gain holiness in hardship when we're willing to yield to God and say, God, what are you doing? What do I need to look at in my own heart in this situation? Finally, we gain grace 
in weakness. Think about the last week and how you've responded in your own life to the difficulty we've faced. Have you found yourself praying when, at times when you hadn't prayed before? Have you found yourself confessing and repenting sin that you hadn't really been thinking about before this week? Have you found yourself switching channels or putting in a CD or, a, or a, uh, something on your phone to worship God in your car? Have you found yourself looking for ways to help when before you hadn't even gone over to your neighbor's house, but now you found yourself wanting to check in on your neighbors? Have, have you found yourself wanting to be generous and give to others? If, if trouble has brought these things out, and these are things that are like Jesus, then we can rejoice that trouble is, a, is doing its work in our hearts. The grace of God is working on our hearts, and it's drawing out of us the power of Christ by grace. And we can rejoice in gaining Jesus. We have gained in trouble the power of the grace of Christ. I had somebody say to me the other day, uh, someone, uh, I should say this, who was older, who has been through uh, a number of things. You know, for those of us my age, we've been through 9-11, and uh, we saw the uh, space shuttle explode. Of People who are a little bit older have seen, you know, John F. Kennedy assassinated and gone through Vietnam. Uh, folks who have been older have seen more stuff. And this uh, older gentleman said this to me, you know what, I've been, been on this planet a long time. I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen the country shut down like this before. So here's the thing. If we're facing trouble unlike any other time, then we have a great opportunity unlike any other time. An opportunity to face trouble and gain the grace of Christ. And what we don't want to do is let this opportunity pass us by with this contentment and anger at God. We want to take full advantage of this opportunity and press in and say, God, this is troubling, and we don't know when this troublesome time will end. Don't let this trouble go by, God, without me experiencing the powerful grace of Christ. So if you're watching this and you've never put your faith in Christ for forgiveness, that would be the gain you need. You need the gain of forgiveness. The Bible tells us that when we trust that what Christ did on the cross brings forgiveness to us, that we receive his grace. And since he has risen from the dead, we have new life in him when we trust him. Now is the time, during this time of trouble, to encounter the grace of Christ through faith. But maybe you're a believer and this trouble has brought up things in your life that you didn't even know were there. You can also experience the grace of God in a new and powerful way. Take full advantage of this trouble. Take full advantage of it to work out in your life repentance and prayer and worship and grace and generosity. Don't let this trouble pass by without setting aside our own power and instead pressing deeply into the power of Christ through grace. Our prayer is that by the end of this, if by God's grace it ends soon, we can say, for the sake of Christ, I'm content with my weakness, our trouble, even in hardships and calamities, because it works out in our hearts grace and the power of God. May our prayer be what Paul's prayer was. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness.